Okay, let's start. Welcome everybody. I reiterate what Anne said. Welcome to this session today. And uh, thank you for supporting the work of the Steve Sinner Foundation, um, which is, I presume, what you've all done today by making a small donation for this session. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my name is Jude Tisdall, and I've been teaching this technique for over 20 years. My interest started many years ago, 30 years ago. I was deputy principal at one of the large London drum schools, and Alexander Technique was part of the programme always. It is in colleges for musicians and for actors. And that was my first introduction to it. And then I decided I'd train as an Alexander Technique teacher. I retired from Mountview as deputy principal about 15 years ago, but I'm still, still on the faculty there. I teach there. I teach postgraduate students and I mentor students as they leave their training and go off into the professional world of acting and, and um, musicianship. Um, I've also worked in Denmark and Ireland and Nepal, and I'm completely committed and passionate about this technique. I don't know if anybody knows anything about the technique. I'm going to presume that this is an introduction and that you, you don't know an awful lot. Um, and I'll give you as much information as I can today. And we might do some exercises um, and we might do some floor work if we get time, but an hour is a long time to cover all the things I want. And I want to talk to you and find out from you what your interest is and, and what you're thinking about in um, wanting to uh, listen to this today. So what is the Alexander Technique? Well, um, it's a technique for living. It's um, living in a more conscious way, particularly with regard to how we use ourselves. We use ourselves a lot of the time on automatic pilot. We just do what we do without thinking. And I guess that's necessary for a lot of things. But when we want to change something, we have to really consider how we're using ourselves. Okay, the other thing that Alexander Technique is, it's the freedom to change habits of a lifetime. Of course, as we go through life, we develop habits. We have to, we, you know, we, we have ways, automatic ways of working. But sometimes they don't serve us usefully as we go from year to year and time to time. It's also a practical skill of self-management applicable to um, any activity. Alexander Technique is usually taught one-to-one -one or in groups, small groups, but in a physical space. So I have been teaching online since the beginning of the pandemic and I've learned a lot of, by teaching online, but it isn't the ideal way to learn Alexander Technique. Alexander Technique is best learned one-to-one -one with a teacher. And an Alexander teacher will, through a series of lessons, teach people in a simple and effective way how to break free of old harmful habits, patterns and habits that might well cause pain and stress. And a lot of people come to the Alexander Technique because they've got a bad back, as Mick has today, or they've got anxiety. Um, musicians use it, as we know, um, actors, sports people, but it is a technique that anybody can use if you want to learn how to use yourself more effectively and efficiently. Um, F.M. Alexander, the, the man who discovered this technique was an Australian actor and he had a voice problem. And for an actor to keep losing his voice, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty sad outcome. And despite various doctors and therapists and undergoing treatment, it was still a recurring problem. So he started to understand, he started, he was forensic in what the way he started considering himself. And he started to um, look at what he did every time he opened his mouth. Literally, he put mirrors around him and he thought, I must be doing something when I speak that eventually reduces my ability to speak. And over time, it took him a long time, he did discover that the way he was using himself, using his body, caused him to lose his voice. I'm not going to go into the whole thing of that right now, but um, that's how the technique started. And it evolved and it's now used, as I said, by musicians and sports people, performers, people suffering from pain, anxiety, and the stresses of everyday life. So when you learn the Alexander Technique, you're studying a skill of balance and release. And like any skill, you get better at it if you practice it. So today I'm going to look at some, you know, breathing in a, in a full way into your body. Um, 
how to maybe release compression in joints and muscles. And um, very often we unwittingly make a situation worse in our bodies by, by pulling down. And if we're in pain, we hold on. So if you look at this picture, you'll see somebody slouching and somebody you know, standing in a, in a reduced way. When we, when we sit and we're reduced and we're collapsed, you can see how everything gets pulled in, everything gets pushed forward. You know, you're reducing the ability to breathe easily and freely. But when we use ourselves in a more useful manner, in a, when our posture is better, we create the possibility of using ourselves more effectively. So what I'd like us to do, I'm, I don't want you to have to sit for a full hour. So we're going today to look just at a couple of things to get this idea going of how to use yourself. And as I said, if we have time, we will do some floor work. But for now, we're going to give some thought to how we use this body of ours. You know, we get manuals with everything. We get manuals with our washing machines, with our phones. We get directions on everything from how to build an IKEA wardrobe to how to open a, jam of, a jar of jam. The number of things we do is well, we have our boilers serviced, we have our cars serviced, and we, we don't very much often think about this. We don't get a manual with this. We don't get a warranty. And so what I would like you to consider after today is that you can look after this body so that as you go through life, you have a better um, possibility of not having pain and you can use yourself effectively. So how would we start that? How would we start thinking about using ourselves effectively? The thing is, we're all made to use ourselves well, but through habits and as we go through life, we kind of lose our balance. So what I'd like you to do is to stand up. So if everybody could just stand up. I'm not going to stand up because you'll be seeing me. I won't be able to see you. And as you stand there, not to do anything, I just want you to notice as you stand up. If you're putting your weight on one, now don't change it. I just want you to know, we all have a favorite side. Have you got more weight going into one side of your body than the other side of your body? Just notice, I bet you have. Most of us favor one side. So without doing anything too dramatic, I just want you to have a sense of both of your feet on the floor. So imagine you, you're, you're, each of your foot's like a three pin plug one pin in your heel, two pins, one pin behind your big toe, one pin behind your little toe. And have the sense of being plugged in, plugged into the ground. So the ground is fully supporting you. You're on your feet. And if you find your weight, and if you find your weight going to one side, just check, you know, you can feel it. I can see that some people have, I'm not going to call out names. I just want you to be able to, in a kinesthetic way, have an understanding if the weight is dropping evenly through both sides. And take a breath, don't stop breathing because you're considering how you're standing. So take a breath in. And if you let your arms just hang to your sides, just, yeah. And take a breath in and imagine the breath, I don't know if you can still see me, is expanding you. So breath comes in and it expands your rib cage. It expands the sides of your rib cage, the back and the front. So you're not pulling a breath into the top of your ribs. Imagine you're sending that breath into your back. And again, check your weight. If because you're taking your attention to your breathing, notice if you're going off balance on your feet. And now I want you to just walk around the space you're in. If you've got space, don't rush ahead. Just take your time, walk around your space, even if it's only around the chair, slowly. And again, notice if you're pushing one, your weight into one side or the other. Just notice. And breathe and stop. And think of replugging your feet in again and breathing and come back into sitting in front of the computer. So now when you come into sitting, let's play with our weight again as you sit here. So we all favor a side, we might sit on one hip or the other hip, but we all have sitting bones and we've got two of them. We've got one on each side, they're like little rockers. 
Um, you can put your hands under your bum and check these out if you like. You've got two rockers, you can feel them. And you can rock back and forward on them. So just come back and forward in your rockers. Don't squash your hands too much. And then take your hands away and just have a sense of those sitting bones supporting you on the chair. Have a sense of your whole pelvis. Your pelvis is like an Egyptian chair. So have a sense of this pelvis, the weight of your pelvis supporting you. And be aware of your back. And be aware of the weight on your feet again. Even in sitting, 40% of our weight can be in our feet, in our feet and our sitting bones. So we're not gripping here. So really have a sense of being supported by your chair, supported by the ground, and taking a breath in and out. And now think or notice in listening to me, are you tightening your forehead and your jaw just to hear what I'm saying? You won't hear me any better by doing that. But just notice, because that's what we do, especially in this arena of, of um, you know, of Zoom. I, I have, to, I remind myself all the time not to be doing this to see students. I don't see them any better and I don't hear them any better, but we're pulled into it. And one of the things that Alexander found when he started doing this investigation of how he used himself was that in his need to communicate and performers want to communicate their, you know, it's, it, it's a job, they're communicators he would pull himself into an audience. And in doing that, he would repress his larynx. Now, I'm not going to go into all that, but he noticed he was doing too much just to do the things he does, he needed to do. So I want you to, again, come back to yourselves, to your breath, to the weight of you on the chair today, just to notice how you're sitting just to sit. Are you doing too much? just to sit here and listen to me. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Have you noticed anything? So what I want you to do, we're going to stand up again, same thing, but before you stand up this time, I just want you to wait. And I want you to consider you're going to stand without, as Maria explained, compressing anything to stand. So as much as you're able to, you're going to stand, and then immediately find the support in your feet. So in your own time, just come forward on your chair and come into standing. So do it in your own time and let your hang, hands hang loosely by your side. Let your chin fall onto your chest for a moment. Just notice the weight of your head this weight that you carry around all the time, the weight of your head on your chin, on your chin, on your chest. And then let your head come into balance, not too far back, just forward. So you're actually seeing forward. So Dave, you soften and drop your chin just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But looking forward. So you're not pulling your head back. The weight of our head is, you know, it's like, it's about nine, 10 pound. That's an old money, of course. I don't know what it is in kilos, but an old money is about nine to and that's a big weight to carry around. So if it's not balanced, it causes a compression, the same compression, Maria. The compression starts from tightening and the head. So I want you to walk around. In a moment, I want you to wait. And I want you to consider as you walk, again, the weight, allowing the weight to come evenly into each foot. And thinking, and just thinking of the space behind you. You're walking forward, but you're considering what's behind you. So you're not being pulled out of yourself just to walk. So mostly we start off in this world with the ability to move freely. You look at a child, they just move freely. They're all are stacked up in the right way. You see a child sitting on the floor, feet sticking out, bottom on the floor, and everything is just stacked up beautifully. And as we go through life, how that gets reduced, I think it starts getting reduced when children go to school and they're sitting at desks like this and all that kind of, and that becomes their habitual pattern. So they lose the ability to be flexible. And of course, as we go through life, you know, we take on postures to protect ourselves at different times. We might be shy, um, we might have had a trauma, we might have had an injury, and we start doing things to protect ourselves. And then we hold on to that 
rather than letting it go. So as we go through life, it's like it's a habit on a habit on a habit to survive. And then all of a sudden we end up at 25 wanting to sing and we can't open our mouths properly because we're held and restricted here. Or older and we're trying to do a yoga um, pose or we're trying to run or doing all the kinds of things. And then you get to 60 or something. And then one of my pet hates is seeing that, um, you know, on road signs, you see the old lady over a stick. Now that old lady wasn't born like that. And nobody, you know, unless you had some real trauma in our lives, there's no way you're going to end up like that. None of us are going to end up like that. But we have to be aware of what we do. We see people, you know, people get tight and things. Okay, I want, and it's because we use too much tension. We do too much every day just to do the things we do. I want you to make a fist. I make two fists. Okay, everybody, two fists. And I don't I can't see you, but I presume you're having making two fists. Okay, now. Okay, just imagine in these fists, you've got the most beautiful pink butterfly. It's probably bloody well dead now, isn't it? Because you've done so much just to hold your fist. <laughs> you've killed the pink butterflies, each and every one of you. So I want you to start again and hold your fist. And you're conscious that you've got these little pink butterflies. You've still got a fist, but you're not squashing the beauty of the butterfly. Now, it's a very simple, silly thing. I know you didn't come here today to find out how not to squash a butterfly. But if you think what you did just on my suggestion that you did something, you realise the amount of tension we put into everything. So let the poor butterflies go, dead or otherwise, are gone. <clears throat> so we do so much. Think of how you clean your teeth in the morning. Yeah, you probably get up and you're not thinking and you scrub like you're scrubbing a doorstep or something and you're only cleaning your teeth or you make a cup of tea and you're already running and you're tight so over the next week i would like you all to take two things you do every day just for your own investigation and notice what you do just to do them what can you do with less effort we put, and I'm not suggesting that you collapse and that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're careless about things, but we put so much effort into doing the smallest mundane task, whether it's cleaning your teeth. You see people, they get their phones, and they look at their phones like the meaning of life is in that phone. There's no need to do it. You're still going to see the phone if you hold it like that. But we put so much into everything, and then we wonder at the end of the day, we're to Oh my God, I'm full of creaks. I can't unlock myself, my neck. Oh my God, oh my God. I have to collapse on my sofa. And then you're finished completely because you're in a complete state of collapse on the sofa with your tension all stuck in there. So I invite you over the next little while to just notice what you do and to start that process of doing less. It's an old thing, isn't it? Everybody says less is more, less is more. But in the way you use yourself, less is more. We've only got this one thing, this one body, from grave, from the from birth to grave. And unless we look after it, it's not going to last us out. Why do people, you know, there are things people are born with and, and, and issues and we get ill. But if you think of when you get a pain, you know, whether you've got a headache or whether you've hit your knee or anything and you're holding on to pain. And Nixon, I know, is in pain today because he's sent us a little note. But and sometimes when we hold on to pain, we just grip. Think of the times when you hurt yourself and you grip. It's a, it's a response. And what you're doing is gripping onto the pain. You're not giving the chance of your, your uh, muscles to release, your muscles to expand, your gripping tissue, you know, your, the, the muscles and the tissue, and you're just tightening. So that's another thing I want you to think about. Think about what you do when something happens that tightens you. So think about what tension you hold and think of when you grip too much. Any questions at this stage? When did we start using ourselves in this way that we interfere with ourselves effectively? When the reasons are many, they could be physical, as I said, the way we collapse and sit in chairs, the physical thing. We might be shy and wanting to hide. So, you know, you see people and you particularly tall people and teenagers, they do this all the time. They don't want to be seen. Um, it could be a trauma, a psychological trauma, when the body freezes and we get used to holding to protect ourselves. And over time, all the things we did to protect ourselves becomes a problem. 
So you need to undo them. What I'm going to do, I'm going today to try and just spend, okay, yeah, we've got time, um, lying down on the floor. This is, this is um, uh, um, a position that we use in Alexander Technique. Um, lots of different disciplines use lying in this particular position. You'll see that this little sketch, the knees, as I suggested to Mike, the knees are um, going towards the ceiling, the legs in a kind of triangle, the knee is the apex of the triangle, the feet supporting you, the pelvis, the head is resting on some paperbacks. I think I sent a note to everybody to have some paperbacks ready if they're going to lie on the floor. And this is kind of what's called a reset position. It's stopping. And it's not just lying in your bed or relaxing. It's in a very conscious way, resetting, reframing your responses. Um, some very famous choreographers used to work this, use this position um, to, to put the steps into their dancer's head. So if a dancer, so that they aren't interfering with the last step, something else. So if they were doing a new a piece of work, um, Martha Graham was the woman who used to do this. She used to put the dancers in this position and she used to recite to them the movements. So she was actually triggering the kinesthetic memory, the muscular memory. So she was through the thinking, telling the muscles how she wanted them to respond, how she wanted her dancers to respond. So she'd have them lying in this position for say half an hour at the beginning of every rehearsal, every, every new, new dance she was doing. And she talked them through that music, you know, you know, if she was going to toe heel or pirouette or move an arm. And she wouldn't want the dancers to do that. She wanted them to have, to open up the neural pathways between the thinking and what was going to happen in the muscles. So today I'm going to, I'm not going to teach you how to do a dance today, that's for sure. I am going to ask, consider how you breathe today. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to find a space on your floor. Okay, if you make sure, just to notice, because this is, this is just building up an awareness. So make sure it's not your neck that's resting on the books, that it is just the back of your head, that bony part of the back of your head resting on the books. And just notice if your head's been pulled back and it's very subtle this, or it's been pushed forward. Just notice if you're aligned, if the back of your neck is lengthening. Now, if we were doing sessions all the time, you'd get used to this language. I know it's a bit foreign to begin with, but the idea that you're, the back of your neck is lengthening. And as you lie there, make sure that your feet are in parallel with your hips. So your, your feet, your legs are like a triangle. And the knee is the apex of the triangle, being directed towards the ceiling. And your feet are flat on the floor. And letting your hands rest on your belly. And if they're clasped, open them. Just have them underneath your rib cage. And you're aware of your breath coming in and out. Just notice the movement of your ribs underneath your hands. Just be there with your breath, with yourself and allowing the floor to take your weight. Really enjoy the sense of giving your weight over to gravity, allowing the floor to support you. And nothing to do except lie here just for a few minutes, resetting, allowing yourself to be at ease. Imagine the weight of you leaving an imprint on the floor. Have a sense of the weight of your shoulder blades, the space between your shoulder blades. And when we start this practice, it's like any skill, you build on it. The ideal would be to lie down for 20 minutes like this every day. There's been a lot of research done on this position. And one of the things that happens when we lie like this and we allow ourselves to be free of holding is that the space between our vertebrae starts opening up. The fluid in between the vertebrae has a space to come home to. It's like coming home to yourself. So when you stand up eventually, you feel lengthened. Indeed, you would be, if you're lying down here for 20 minutes, be lengthened when you stand up. But we're just going to lie down for 10 minutes today. 
Again, be aware of the weight of your head being supported by the books. And this is a funny one, but have a sense of your eyes releasing back into the space of your skull. Have your jaw, have a thought of your jaw being soft. Be aware of the space in your mouth. Imagine the roof of your mouth like a cathedral and the, your tongue is the floor. Your tongue is resting on the floor of this cathedral. And your breath is coming in gently. And of course we know where the breath comes into, but I want you Im to imagine the breath coming in through your nose, not pulling it in, just allow it to come in and imagine it going in and painting your ribs at the back. Really have a sense of filling your lungs and your rib cage at the back. So taking your breath in and sending it into your back. And if your hands are still on your rib cage, have a sense of the breath coming in to the side of your ribs and the front of your ribs as if the breath is also feeding your fingers. So again, a breath in, softening your mouth. So what you're doing in a very conscious way you're allowing your breath to fill your whole rib cage, your lungs. And now I want you to take your attention to your pelvis. Such a heavy part of us. And lying here like this, you can just let the floor take the weight of your pelvis. Have a sense of the width of your pelvis. Again, imagine a breath coming into your pelvis and painting a circle on the inside of your pelvis. So from the back, the sides, around the front. And you can place your hands now on your pelvis. And imagine your breath coming in deeply into that area of your body. And take your attention to your feet, to each toe, the little toe, second toe, third toe, fourth and your big toe. And imagine as if they're swimming away from your heels. And your legs are fully supported by your feet and your pelvis. And from the space of your pelvis and your feet, your knees are floating towards the ceiling. And go back to the thought of your breath again. Allowing the breath to come in. Have a sense now of the weight of your upper arms on the floor. Have a sense of the space in your elbows. Enjoy just being here with your breath, with yourself, allowing the floor to take all of you. Nothing to do, but in a very conscious way, connecting with yourself and your breath. And I'm going to stop talking for a moment and you just paint your own body with your breath for three or four minutes. And if your eyes are closed, open your eyes and just see the space above you. And imagine seeing it from further back. So you're not being pulled forward into seeing the space above you or just slightly in front of you. And gently, without involving your neck or without tightening, just very gently roll your head from side to side on the books. I know that's hard for you, Marie, because you've got your headphones on, don't worry. Just very slowly, not disturbing anything and keeping your eyes open. It's almost like you're letting your eyes lead the movement from side to side and then back to center. And now I want you to take your hand and place it on your sternum. And to think the thought, because our thought is what actually triggers a response in our muscular system 
in our kinesthetic system. I want you to imagine this hand on your sternum, softening your sternum, as if your sternum is melting, as if the ribs are floating off the sternum. And again, letting a breath come in, connecting with your sternum. And I want you to imagine your sternum dropping back and melting back to the space between your shoulder blades. So a lot of things to imagine, but I want you to have that thought. And then let it go. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to come into standing, but I want you to wait because lying here, Something will have changed. Of course it will. Everything changes all the time. And I'm going to say to you now, when you stand up, not to shake yourself into the way that you normally are, the way you feel, what you do. You feel a little slight, slightly different. But I want you to take your time. I want you to roll onto one side and use your upper hand to support you as you roll onto one side. And then gently come into standing. You can come onto all fours if you want to, whatever way. But what I want you to try not to do is to tighten your neck and hold onto your head. So roll onto your side, come up onto all, in whatever way. I'm not watching you do whatever way is good for you, but trying not to tighten. And when you come back onto your two feet, I want you just to take your attention again to your feet, to being plugged into gravity. To be aware of your back. Imagine the floor is still supporting your back. Don't shake yourself into feeling right, fixing yourself. Just notice, notice if some little subtle difference has changed just because you've stopped and noticed what it is to breathe into the various spaces of you. Just notice, nothing to do, and then come and sit down. And as you sit here, Again, imagine you've still got the floor behind you. We spend so much time on Zoom and computers nowadays. I want you to think more back. So you're not going to come forward to hear me or anything. Just stay back, stay back in that support you got from the floor. Let your hands rest on your thighs. Allow your breath to fill you. Be aware of the weight of your pelvis. Be aware of your feet on the floor. Be aware of the space in your mouth and breathe. Okay, and I am going to ask, you know, I want feedback. Do you notice anything different? Yes. We have no control over a lot of things in our lives, but what we do have is control over our response to that. If we just take a moment to pause, so it's, it's stopping, it's pause, and we can. Look, if a bear came into my living room now, I'd run. I wouldn't stop and think, what am I going to do with the bear? You know, it would be a, it would be a thing I'd have to react to. But if somebody knocks at my door, I'm not going to jump up and just go because I don't need the same reaction to open my door. Or if my phone goes, then if a bear comes into the back, into, into the back hall, I, you know, it's different. So start noticing how you use yourself when you do too much just to do what you do. So I invite you over the next week couple of weeks to actually notice what you do. It's our habits that stop us change. It's much easier to give into a habit than to change it. But to be mindful and not give in habit, to give into a habit, that's where change starts. Any questions? A book yep. that I recommend if you're starting, um, and it's a very good book. It's um, called Body, Breath and Being, which she's going to send it to you. It comes a woman called Carolyn Nichols, and it's um, it's a no jargon um, book on the Alexander technique. F. M. Alexander himself was a brilliant man, but my God, his books are dense. And you know, I remember when I was training, I had to read them. It was like going through mud every day. But there's been lots of good books written by um, people to explain the technique, and this one is particularly good. And it comes with a CD. And it guides you through lying in semi-supine and it talks you through it. Different, I mean, if we were doing this week and week out, I'd have different things for you to consider. And the CD does that. And if you're interested in the technique, it's a really good starting book because you won't find a teacher at the moment because you can't have one-to-one -one you know, teaching at the moment. Um, 
and uh, thank you all for joining us today and good luck think about yourselves and uh, do less thank you <laughs> thank you very much jude